Return. Return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. The cry is the voices of the daughters of Jerusalem, who are the ladies in waiting to the bride of Solomon. Her name, Shulamite. And they are responding to the declaration of Solomon for his bride. So great, so appreciative, so superlative were those words that the response of the daughters of Jerusalem appear to be an interruption, to actually interrupt the declaration and the joy of Solomon for his bride. Let's go back a few verses and listen. And listen with them, these daughters of Jerusalem, to what they're hearing Solomon say. My beloved has gone down into his garden. I, I've gone down. Who is she? that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon. But just before that, he says, Thou art beautiful, O oh, my love, as Tirza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. As a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines, and virgin without number. My dove, my undefiled is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice of the one that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourisheth and the pomegranates, pomegranates budded or ever I was aware my soul made me like the chariots of Aminadab. And then they respond. After hearing him say all of this, they say, Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. And Solomon goes on speaking, what will you see in the Shulamite? He says to them, you can't see this in your King James, but those who explain from the Hebrew point that this is what is taking place. And he says, as it were, the company of two armies. And then he begins a portion of which I read only the first verse of the seventh chapter. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O princess daughter. There are a lot of explanations for the Song of Solomon. And I could go into the different interpretations. But suffice it to say that the Song of Solomon is a, is a picture of true love between a man and a woman. Whenever we read Scripture, if we try to, first of all, get the allegorical meaning, we miss something very important. Primarily, it is the story of true love. And if a person wants to find a story of true love, all he has to do is turn to God's Word. And the story is written here in beautiful language in good taste, anointed and sacred. 
for it is indeed the story of true love. But the beauty of true love of a man and a woman, and because it is a true, because it is true, holy, and pure, it illustrates the love of God and Israel in the Old Testament times, and illustrates the love of Christ and the church. For New Testament times. What I'm about to share with you this morning is not something for you to be all upset over with theologically. Whatever your problems are, the Holy Spirit has none, and he wrote this. But I don't want you to miss the obvious. In this case, I don't want you to admit the admiration and the fascination of the daughters of Jerusalem, probably the royal harem, the ladies in waiting. This admiration, this fascination that these daughters have not only for the king. For in the beginning verses, as we shall read, we'll see that they already with her have a love for the king. But the love and the admiration and the fascination that they have for the bride, for his bride, the Shulamite. For in this most beautiful and most wonderful fascination for the bride of Solomon, together with its spiritual meanings, there is a theology of love and appreciation for a person or for persons who are truly in love with Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Oh, sure, they love the king. It starts off the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And she's saying, this beautiful country girl, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Look what happens in the next two or three verses. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me. And then something happens. We, she says, draw me. We. Draw me. We. Immediately. The virgins and the daughters of Jerusalem. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We! My, that's fascinating to me. This very sacred, holy, and intimate place, draw me. We! I go into the bedchamber of the king. We! Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. We will be glad and rejoice in thee, and we will remember thy love more than wine. Then it states a wonderful truth. The upright love thee. The upright love thee. Hmm. She's She's enraptured with the king. And so are they. So much so that while she up to him, she says, draw me, we. And she talks about all of them. <laughs> Boy, they're in love with him. Hallelujah. Professedly, we all love him. But actually, most of us do not. 
But this bride knows there's somebody that loves him besides her. Not chosen to be the bride proper. But chosen nevertheless. The upright loved thee. He found her somewhere in the countryside. And what he saw in her, he could find in no other. She was not as white and as ivory as the daughters of Jerusalem, the ladies in waiting. In fact, she was suntanned. But he found her to be more beautiful than all the others. She, feeling rather apologetic, said to the ladies in waiting, to the daughters of Jerusalem, I am black, but comely. O oh, ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Keter, as the curtains of Solomon, these, of course, were made out of black goat's hair, look not upon me because I'm black. In other words, don't, don't think badly of me because I'm not as white and as beautiful as you are. Her humility, her humility is very obvious. The sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me, and they made me the keeper of the vineyards. But mine own vineyard have I not kept. I've been tending these vineyards, and I'm the sun's blackened me, and but I've not been able to take care of my own, my own body. I've not been able to make it as white and pearly as you daughters of Jerusalem. And so she's apologetic. She's humble. But she doesn't know her own beauty. Solomon knew it. He saw her. And out of all that was bequeathed to him of the royal household, queens and concubines, he chose not one of them. He chose this beautiful girl that he found in the countryside. What's so amazing is that they find that she's altogether lovely also. Instead of being jealous, they are enraptured with her. She goes on to ask the question, Tell me, O thou, whom my soul lovest, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, for why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy, of thy companions? Why should I be as one veiled in the middle of all these ladies in waiting, and they're so enraptured with her, and immediately they see her beauty, and listen to how they say. Listen to their response. If thou know not, O oh, thou fairest among women, they're already caught up with her beauty. O oh, thou fairest among women, they're very touched. They're very moved. And they're very pleased with the king's choice. Well, what makes her so attractive? By Eastern standards, the whiter the flesh, the more beautiful. That is, if a person's white. So all the ladies were kept in and out of the sun, were pampered and perfumed and made to be attractive ornaments. I know that's chauvinistic, but try to think back and be fair to 3,000 years ago. Don't be grumpy and ignorant and stupid, if you please. A thousand years from now, your values won't look so virtuous either. I don't think it'll ever last that long, but if we have a thousand years, we'll be ashamed of some of the practices that we held socially and some of the things, and there'll be some new group declaring something else to be chauvinistic and what have you. I'm not interested. The Holy Spirit wrote this, and he wasn't interested. 
He was interested in bringing something out that the world needs to know. He was interested in betraying true love as it really is. He was interested in something else. He was interested in our observing those who love the king. And ours, our finding out how attractive someone who really loves the king really is. Even though they may have been keeping someone else's vineyards. Not had time to take care of their own interests. I think the first thing that makes her so attractive is that she's single-minded. In the fifth chapter, in the eighth verse, she speaks to these daughters of Jerusalem. And she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick. It should be translated, I am lovesick, or I am sick of love. That is, I'm so much in love with him, I, I just feel sick. Hmm. And they answer her, What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another that thou dost charge us like this? See, she is so in love with him. They're so astonished with it. But they're still, though they haven't reached the depths of it, they're still calling her the fairest among women. They're using the same terms that Solomon himself has used. By the way, if you've ever heard Jesus call the lily of the valley no, or the rose of Sharon, nowhere does the Scriptures call Jesus the rose of Sharon or the lily of the valley. That's not Jesus. That's the bride. In the second chapter, in the first verse, it's the bride speaking, and she's speaking with humility. She's speaking concerning the commonality of the rose, of the rose among many roses, the commonality of the lily among lilies. It's not something glorious and beautiful except that a lily and a rose is, well, not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed more beautifully than a lily and a rose. But there may be 10,000 in the field. So she says, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. But he responds, and you can't see this in your King James, but he responds and says, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. He's the one that brings out her being special. She says, I am not special. I'm the, like a rose of Sharon. If you've been along the Sharon Valley, you saw roses, 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 and lilies, 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 lilies. But he said, wait just a minute. You're not just the rose of Sharon. You're not just a lily of the valley. He said, you are a lily among thorns. That's quite a contrast. I like the way the king sees her, don't you? What I'm talking about this, keep in mind that the church is being represented here. And if you don't care for that, if you can't think collective, keep in mind that you are represented here. The princess is you, the Shulamite. The princess is us, if you please. For we are the church. We are the chosen one. But oh, would to God those who have held a theology and a philosophy of the church could have seen the beauty that's involved here. I've heard people say, well, I see the church and I love the church. And they go to criticizing everybody that goes by his name. They don't love the church. They don't see the church. The church is not something symbolic. The church is you and me and everyone else that loves Christ with all of their hearts. I love the church. And yet, on the phone, you hear them criticize their neighbor. No, they don't love the church. Capital N-O, they do not, nor do they see it. But Solomon sees her. The king of glory, the Solomon of peace, 
the great Prince of Peace, he sees her. And so do these, whoever they are, daughters of Jerusalem, that have come to admire this love so much, they see her. They see her either individually or collectively. And they say, oh, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? When Kelly got up the other night, did you see her? Did you see her? Did you see the bride of Christ? Not just the bride of Keith. That's good. True love. Did you see that even? But did you see her, the bride of Christ? I did. Have you seen Patty all these weeks that she's testified? Have you seen how beautiful she is? I mean, as his bride, as the bride of Christ. If you didn't, you're just simply missing it. I could, I could preach this thing like a machine gun, and you'd miss most of it, but I thought I'd take my time and get it out to you. There's a great feeding going on here, folks. There's a great thing happening here today. And if I'm broken enough over it to, and to be blessed about it and being able to give it, you'll know something wonderful is going on up here. And something has, had been, has been showed me, your pastor, that I knew would be good for you today. I charge you, he said, oh, daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my lover that you tell him I am sick single-mindedness and they're amazed with it and she becomes all the more beautiful for they've been in the king's household all this while pampered and protected but not so nearly in love as this woman instead of resenting it like the elder brother did when the prodigal came home they're saying my God how beautiful you are my, you are beautiful than any woman we've ever seen. We're learning something from you. The thing that provoked their admiration was her single-mindedness. Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, or lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, or where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If the eye... If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Boy, they're seeing a woman full of light. She's got a single eye for the love of the Master. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. You see, it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the professed church. It's everywhere. How great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's impossible to do it. The daughters of Jerusalem found one who was not pampered, who was not powdered, and who was not protected. But they found a woman who had a single eye for the king, and they found that her love was greater than all of theirs, and they knew the reason why she was chosen. Single-mindedness. They found also that she was like Esther in that, uh, well, let me read it to you. In Esther, the second chapter, in the 15th verse, now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Ab Abahai, or Habael, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was, co was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but... You've heard me say she required nothing, but no, that's not all there is to it. 
She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. And so Esther was taken unto the king Ahasuerus and to his house royal in the tenth month, which is in the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Hmm. She required nothing but the one who was in attendant to the king knew what the king liked. And so she let the, she let the king's helper do all the choosing for her. The Holy Spirit knows what, God's, knows what God likes. And you and I are to let him do all the choosing. That's the reason... One of the great saints wrote these words that have been with me now here in 13 years and back in St. Paris too. As Dick and Bobby may remember when I quoted this old poem, Thy way, not mine, O Lord, however dark it be, lead me by thine own hand. Choose out the path for me. I dare not choose my lot. I would not if I might. Choose thou for me, my God, so shall I walk aright. Not mine, not mine the choice in things great or small. Be thou my guide, my strength, my wisdom, and my all. The Holy Spirit knows what is holy, the Holy Spirit knows what is right, the Holy Spirit knows what is good, and we, when we don't choose, when we require nothing but what the Holy Spirit requires, we please God, and amazingly, we get the very thing we desire the most. So you see, requiring nothing is a complement to single-mindedness. Single-minded, we require nothing. We're just happy with the king. The girls wanted the powder and the perfume. The daughters of Jerusalem wanted the white face and all the rest. Uh, shoot a match, she just wanted the king. Tell him I'm sick with love for him. Don't send me in perfume. Don't send me any powder. Send me in the king. Boy, these daughters are amazed with it because they like the palace. They like their beautiful rooms. They like their curtains. They like the smells. They like the table spread. They like all the rest. But I tell you, Solomon was looking for somebody who just liked him. Not his provisions. You and I are so much like those daughters of Jerusalem. We like the powder. We like the perfume. We like the provisions. We often are heard to say, God, give me more. I like it. Give me more. Got to have this. Got to have this position. Got to have more pay. Got to have this. You ain't got to have nothing. We're to require nothing but. But what the king's executive officer chooses for us. And his choice will be whatever pleases the king. And that will make us find favor, grace, and acceptance in his sight. Well, what else makes this woman so attractive? If you think I got this out of a book, you got another thing coming. I got it out of a book, all right. It's called the old book, the Holy Bible. I couldn't find it in the book, but I found it in here, in the gray holiness of his word. Single-mindedness, requiring nothing, and then there's something else here. It's called in inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. I read it to you when we got started. No man's an island. No woman's an island. No bride's an island. This beautiful bridegroom and this bride, they're not an island. That's why we're going to have a church public wedding. They're not an island. 
what Brent does involves Oilton, Oklahoma, and one of the most beautiful set of parents and beautiful pastors there is on the face of this earth. What Debbie does involves her mother and her daddy and involves this pastor and involves this group of people. And the only way in the world for us to make it together is simply do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And that's making them happy and that's making us happy here at Scott Depot and in Oilton. But I'll tell you what, it's not exclusive. It's inclusive. That's why they're such precious children. But such precious young people. You'll excuse me, Brent, but she's still like a child to me. She's she's a grown woman, beautiful as you well know. But you know, uh, she's still like a little princess, if you please. You know, we love her very much, just like we love you. She's been one of our prizes, and uh, we know you're one of the prizes out there. And we got two prizes together, you know. And, <laughs> But you see, it's, it's not an exclusive thing. You don't take your love and run out the door and never come back. If you do, it will never be fulfilled and never be satisfied. Hear me, hear me. Hear me. What did she say? Draw me, we. Draw me, we. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We, look how inclusive. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. We love thee. Inclusiveness. What makes you nauseated about a young couple in love? Exclusiveness. What makes you feel good about it? Inclusiveness. Everybody loves a lover if they're a true lover. And everybody holds their nose if they're not a true lover. If it's selfish, it stinks. Brother, this woman had a greater love for the king than anybody had ever found. But, well, wonder of it all, he included everybody. Wonder of it all, it included the ones who wanted him too. Ladies in waiting that made her admire him and love him. Hmm. But this inclusiveness is all for a purpose. It's all for a purpose. When she told him, the daughters of Jerusalem, to tell King Solomon that she was just sick with love and she wanted him and him only. They were a little bit, well, they saw she was the most beautiful of women. They saw that she loved him the most. But there's a little question in their mind, and I read it to you a while ago. She said, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick with love. And they said, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? Maybe they're taunting her a little bit. Well, maybe they really don't know, O oh, thou fairest among women. What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost charge us? And brother, she gives him an answer. My beloved. You see, you may not understand. I don't have time to explain the Eastern meanings. But if you take time to study this book, the rabbis wouldn't let anybody study it under 30 years of age. So I'll not say what age it should be, but if you're over 30, you should go according to the rabbinic recommendation. It's your time to get into this book. But I don't have time to explain all the Eastern meetings, so you just have to. Some things don't register with us because it's Eastern talk. Our talk doesn't register with them either. You have to take time to study it, but you can get, you can get the feeling and you can get the overall meaning of what's being said. So it says, well, what, what, is he, what is he more as a beloved than any other? And what, what, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost charge us with this, to give this message to him, that you're really in love with him, that you're absolutely sick with this love? And so she looks at him, including them, but giving them an answer. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousand. His head is the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. Now you see, 
I'm touched with that. And the word for word, it doesn't mean to me what it meant to them, but I'm touched with what she's saying. I'm touched with her love. I'm touched. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters. And I, I understand that better. I've seen the eyes of a dove. Washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the beryl. His stomach is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as leaven and excellent as the cedars. I've seen those too. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. They're almost in a state of shock. Because she's answered that question quite well. In fact, they've missed the depth of this love. Sometimes you can be so close to it that you miss it. So they, suddenly, they cry out, I want you to look. Whether is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whether is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? We want him too. Where is he? Where did he go? Oh, we see better. Now we will seek him with thee. And when we really have loved Jesus, so that the daughters will say to us, we're going with you, we'll seek him with thee, and we've accomplished our purpose. For our purpose is to glorify God, and don't you forget it, to enjoy him forever and forever. And there are halfway half sincere professors all around us that if we give them a good answer and show them single mindedness and require nothing and we include them because this fellowship is just running back and forth they'll be saying to us whether is thy beloved gone O thou fairest among women where is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee we want to go with you How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that say unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. How beautiful are those feet. Says him here, but in spiritual type, it's her, it's the Shulamite, it's the bride of Christ, in particular, the man of God. Paul said in Ephesians, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his poetry, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. 
And Paul, responding to that great truth, said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. See, that's the spirit of the Shulamite. I have suffered the loss of all things. What do you mean loss of all things? Well, he's talking about his heritage. He's talking about his religion. He's talking about his denomination. He's talking about his proud speech. He's talking about his birth and all that goes with his heritage. He said, I count all that as lost. That I might know this king for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but manure that I may win Christ. Oh, uh-oh. But listen to this. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything be ye otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, where do we have already attained? Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us as an ensample. Look at me. I am the Shulamite. Paul's the only one I know who's had courage to say that, but it's the truth. Look at me. I love the king. You love him like I do. That's what he's saying. Be followers of me. It's a tragic shame that I would ever have to encourage anybody in this church to go to a wedding upon God. It's a tragic shame. That you and I haven't seen the Shulamite. It's a tragic shame that we haven't had enough wisdom as these daughters of Jerusalem. It's a tragic shame that I ever have to plead with anybody to do the will of God. It's a tragic shame that any of us had ever run from the will of God. We haven't seen enough beauty to say to her, Listen, where is he? I want to go with you. It's a rotten shame and it shows that we're professors, brother, and backslidden ones at that. Shulamite made herself clear through the princes and the princesses of God that have loved him with all their heart. We have anything near the division the of these daughters of Jerusalem that say, hey, where is he? We want to go with him. We want to go with you to find him. Now, if you're not filled with carnality, you're stirred up pretty wonderful. Now, everything's quiet in here, and not all of it's blessed. What are we living for? If not for him. What are we living for? If not to count all things as lost, that we might know the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, that all, that all things in our life might be secondary to the will of God. What are we living for? It means we're living for dung. It means we're living for manure. And we choose that over the love of this great King, our Lord. You say, oh, no, I love him. No, you don't. Your love is revealed in your response to the bride who is, has such a deep love for him. She's so lovesick. It's, your, it's revealed in that response, my friends. And it's always been this way. Praise be for those who will simply take my recommendation with reference to God's will if they haven't seen the loveliness of the Shulamite. God wants this church to be the Shulamite. You know, I'm touched that Bobby would come. Bobby, I loved him. Dick, I loved Christ. When I was in St. Paris and I gave it everything I had. Dick was a truck driver. And he made me, he made me love all truck drivers. And a good one at that. Blessed be the night that I was preaching in a little old country church with the windows open, no air conditioning. Somewhere in the middle of the service. <laughs> Those truck drivers can't choose to be off on Sunday many times. I looked out the window to the right and I saw a man in a white shirt and dress slacks. For he had hastily changed from his driving clothes and running with all he was worth down the middle of that road to get to the house of God. 
What did Dick see? What did Bobby see? They saw someone that loved the king. I can say that that's true in those days. Whether it's true now or not, it was true in those days. Somebody loved the king. And it touched Bobby's life. And Bobby, being only about 18 and a half today or 19, was 13 years younger then. You count it up. Brother, something's got to be going on to attract a five or six-year-old. It's the youngest of the children that's been here the most. It brought this beautiful father and this wonderful mother back here today. Dick and Dottie, this is great. I'll tell you, I saw a man, I saw a man that was in love with the Shulamite running past the windows. Came in and sat on the second seat where everybody else sat closer to the middle and to the back. And so did your mother and dad, Tim. Bobby asked about you last night. They saw the Shulamite. They saw... I know this is dangerous, but you've got to get it some way. I'm just saying back in those days, I know that I love the king. I know that much. Your mother and daddy saw that. And Tim, you were young, but you saw it too. And he's here today. I don't want to hear your excuses. I'm tired of them. I'm 44 years sick with them. As a little boy, when I sit on the front seat, seven or eight years old, and the man of God was preaching under a great anointing. And after 70 minutes of preaching, the glory of God was everywhere, and Jesus was walking the aisles. The angels seemed about ready to fly down and spread their wings. He looked at his watch, and he stopped. Oh, he said, i got to quit. He said, I've been preaching 70 minutes, and I, unknown to myself, I was so much in love with the man who was in love with the king. I jumped straight up out of my seat, and I hollered at the top of my voice, No! Don't stop! And the crowd laughed. And he looked down at me and said, I wish everybody felt that way. And he stopped. That's not the church. Here's the church. Return. Return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. For you are the body of Christ. And we see this true love in thee. And this is what we want. Let us go with thee to find him. Return. Return. Our decisions these last few days have told us whether or not we really are crying like the daughters of Jerusalem. Let us stand for prayer. Father, forgive us, for we know not what we do. Send light that we may have vision this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.